بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بأحسن إلى يوم الدين رضيت بالله ربا وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا ربي أعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين وأعوذ بك رب أن يحضرون ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم Continuing on with the Prophet والسلام's legendary government and military legacy the era of Omar bin Khattab uh, this uh, is a redo on video uh, number 32 2.5 evidence on which the judge may rely the evidence on which the judge may rely in passing rulings is confession and writing in is regarded as a kind of confession picking up from page number 516 um, number two testimony the judge is required to verify that witnesses are qualified to testify if he does not know them himself then he should ask them to bring someone who does know them. A man gave testimony to Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab and he said to him, I do not know you. But it does not matter that I do not know you. Bring me someone who does know you. A man among the people said, I know him. Umar asked, what do you know about him? He said, he is of good character and it's And is a virtuous man. He asked, is he your closest neighbor who you know by night and by day? And you know when he comes in and goes out? He said, no. He asked, do you have any financial dealings with him? Which is the way to know whether he is God-fearing or not? He said, no. He then asked, has he been to your companion on a journey? Which is the way... To know whether he is of noble character and attitude, he said no. He, Umar radiallahu anhu, then, then said, you do not know him. Testimony takes precedent over an oath. Whether that testimony is established before his opponent swears an oath or afterwards. If the plaintiff asks the defendant to swear an oath and the judge makes him do so, And the plaintiff brings proofs after that concerning his case. His evidence is to be accepted and the oath is to be rejected. Omar said a false oath is more deserving of being rejected than clear proof. The one who is to be asked to give testimony is the plaintiff. Omar wrote to Abu Musa saying proof is to be provided by the plaintiff and the oath is to be sworn by the one who denies it. If the plaintiff has only one witness, his testimony should be accepted and the plaintiff should be also, or the plaintiff should also swear an oath. Omar used to pass judgment in financial cases on the basis of an oath and a single witness. Number three, oaths. The judge should not resort to ask the defendant to swear an oath except when the plaintiff is unable to establish proof and asks the defendant to swear an oath. If he swears an oath, then the judge must rule according to that oath. Umar and Ubay ibn Kab refer to Zaid ibn Thabit for judgment concerning a garden, which... Ubay claimed was his, Umar had to swear an oath, and Zaid said, let the Amir al-Mu'minin off. Umar said, why should he let me off, or why should he let the Amir al-Mu'minin off, excuse me, if something belongs to me, I would be entitled to it by virtue of my oath. Otherwise, I would not lay claim to it by the one besides whom there is no other God. This garden is mine, and Ubay has no right to it. After the case was settled, he gave the garden to Ubay as a gift. It was said to him, why didn't you give it to him before the oath? He said, I fear that if I did not swear the oath, the people would not swear oaths for their rights after me. And that would become the norm. But it did become the norm. People do not do anything. Ya <laughs> yeah, Sayyidina. Huh? Everyone who is a Muslim citizen, male Muslim citizen, should, should take notice. 
Subhanallah. Yeah. He he wanted to make sure that the the oath would would be given its right when we swore by it. But here we are now. None of the uh, interesting. Continuing on from page number 518. It is not permissible for one who has to swear and oath to refuse to do so out of piety. We have seen above how Omar swore an oath then when he won his case he gave up his right. In some cases Omar made the oaths carry greater weight by making disputing parties swear oath in a place which was deeply venerated and respected by them so that they would not dare to tell lies in such a place. He made a group from Murah swear an oath in the Hijr. And he made another group swear an oath between the Ruko and the Maqam for detecting family likeliness in cases determining lineage. This is one of the kinds of strong circumstantial evidence that may form the basis of a ruling. This is indicated by the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam and the actions of the rightfully guided Khalifs and the Sahabas radiallahu anhum. Use of such evidence in ruling was approved by Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Abbas and others. Number five, circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence covers a broad category which judges use, use their intelligence to derive examples of strong circumstantial evidence include a woman's pregnancy when she has Never been married. This is regarded as evidence of zina. Another example is given birth before the usual length of pregnancy is over. Yet another example is the presence of two dead persons, one on top of the other. The situation provides strong circumstantial evidence that the one who died first is the one on the bottom and the one who has lay last is, or the one who lay died last on top of the uh, second person. That person was on top of another. Omar ruled that the one on top was the heir of the one on the bottom and that the one on the bottom could not be the heir of the one on the top. An example of circumstantial evidence in the case of drinking alcohol is the presence of wine in a person's vomit. Umar carried out the head punishment for drinking on a person in whose vomit wine was found. Number six, prior knowledge of on the part of the judge. Prior knowledge of on the part of the judge with regard to head punishment is not regarded as evidence which entitles him to issue a judgment against the accused. Umar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu telling him that an imam should not rule on the basis of his knowledge, speculation, or suspicion, he asked Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, What do you think if I saw a man kill, steal, or commit zina? He said, I think that your testimony is like that of any other Muslim man. Ahmad said, Yes, you are right. With regard to hudud punishment, uh, there are various reports from Amr ibn al-Khattab regarding the prior knowledge of the judge and whether that is sufficient knowledge for the judge to pass judgment on that basis if there is no other evidence available. However, Omar radiallahu anhu was keen not to encourage the people to confess their sins, rather he wanted them to repent and to keep the matter between them and Allah jalla jalaluhu sharah bil ibn as-samad. Al-Kindi, who was guarding the border near Al-Madain, addressed the people and said, O oh people, you are in a land where drinking is widespread and there are many women. If any one of you commits a crime that deserves a head punishment, let him come to us so that we may carry it out on him, for that will be his Purification. News of that reached Amr radiallahu and he wrote to him saying, It is not permissible for you to tell the people to remove the concealment of Allah who has concealed them. But if the people referred the matter for judgment, then it was the state that carried out the hard punishment without any lenience. 
When Omar radiallahu anhu wanted to pass a judgment between two disputants, he would recite the following dua, O oh Allah, if you know when two disputants sit before me, that I am worried in the slightest about who is at fault, then do not withhold the punishment from me for an instant 2.6 rulings and punishment merit out by Omar for some crimes and misdemeanors. 2.6.1, forging the official seal of the state. During Omar's Khalifa, a serious event took place which had not taking place before. Ma'an ibn Za'ida managed to forge the seal of the state by engraving something similar which he used to take money from the Baytul Mal of the Muslims. The case was referred to Omar who had him beaten 100 times and imprisoned. Someone tried to intercede on his behalf and he had him beaten another 100 times. Someone else tried to intercede on his behalf and he had him beaten a further hundred times and then banished. 2.6.2, a man who stole, and I think this is because this uh, crime, maybe people did not understand it um, as, as well as they do today, back then as Omar radiallahu anhu did. Uh, he did not accept that this type of behavior uh, took place even on three people. So today in court, if, when this type of white-collar crime takes place, uh, the main thing that the prosecutor is going to be, um, or any, any smart prosecution would just point out that uh, this, this type of crime took place on the main income and disbursement of Muslim treasure. So understand that it happened upon the entire Ummah. Today they'll insert very, very heavily into the theory that uh, this fraudulent activity could have taken place to any of you in the courtroom, right? So imagine that being something unacceptable. 2.6.2, a man who stole from the Baytul Mal in Kufa, Omar did not cut off the hand of one who stole from the Baytul Mal, Ibn Mas'ud asked Omar about a man who stole from the Baytul Mal, and he said, let him go, for there is no one who does not have a right to this wealth. But he had him whipped as a tazir punishment, warning of punishment somehow, 2.6.3, theft during the year of Ramada. During the year of Ramada, the slaves of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a stole a camel belonging to Muzani man, which they slaughtered and ate. The matter was referred to Omar, who went after the slaves, and they admitted that they had stolen it from its proper place, and that those who had stolen it were adults of sound minds. They had no claim of necessity that compelled them to steal. Omar ordered Kathir ibn Asami to cut off their hands, but because he was living through the year of Ramadan and he saw what the people were going through, he looked for an excuse for them. He said to their master, I think that you are starving them. That was all he did in this case. He waived the punishment of amputation and he ordered that the Muzani man be given a camel of twice the value, 800 dirhams. Thus, they were protected from the had punishment because of necessity. 2.6.4 An insane woman who committed zina, an insane woman who had committed zina, was brought to Umar bin al-Khattab. He consulted the people, then he commanded that she be stoned. Ali ibn Abi Talib passed by and said, take her back. Then he came to Umar bin Khattab and said, do you know 
that the pen has been lifted and he quoted the hadith at the end of it he said yes Ali said then why should she be stoned let her go and Omar started to say takbir Allahu Akbar 2.6.5 a demi who forced a Muslim woman to commit zina that happened during the Khalifa of Omar bin Khattab and he crucified him because he had gone against the condition of the treaty. 2.6.6 Forcing women to commit zina. Some slave women who had been forced by some slave men to commit zina were brought to Omar. He beat the men, but he did not beat the woman. The woman who had committed zina was brought to Omar, and she said, I was sleeping, and when I woke up, there was a man on top of me. He let her go and did not beat her. In these cases where there was no uncertainty, or there was some uncertainty, excuse me, the had punishments were waived. No distinction was made between physical force and Threats to kill. During Omar's Khalifa, a woman asked a shepherd for water, but he refused to give it to her unless he let him, unless she let him have his way with her. She did that, and the matter was referred to Omar. He asked Ali, "What do you think about her?" He said she was forced, so Omar gave her something and let her go. 2.6.7 ruling on one who was ignorant of the prohibition of zina. It was narrated from Sa'id ibn al Musayyib that an agent of Umar ibn al Khattab wrote to Umar telling him that a man had admitted to him that he had committed zina. Umar wrote to him telling him, ask him whether he knew that it was haram unlawfully prohibited if he says yes then carry out the had punishment on him if he says no then let him off let then tell him excuse me that it is haram and if he does it again then punish him she got married during her idda but she and her husband did not know that it is haram. A woman got married during her idda in the matter was referred to Umar ibn al-Khattab. He beat her but did not carry out the had punishment on her, sep- separated them and whipped the husband as a had punishment. Uh, so I think we caught up on the uh, videos, uh, Tati. Let's see, we caught up on uh, 32, so that would be video 32, because this is already there. And uh, stop there. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik wa tabarak wa smurabdik wa ta'ala jadduk. Wa la ilaha ghayruk wa la hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Assalamu ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.